Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, wonderful and brilliant uh, youth-led discussion. Uh, tonight will be uh, it will be an history for an, for the African youth, where we will be uh, magnifying and honoring uh, what Mandela Nelson Mandela has fought for near 67 years and what African leaders, what the current African leaders can learn from this struggle and values. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. For that, I will, I will, I will hand over firstly to Dr. Jama Musa Jama, the director of the Harissa Cultural Center and Harissa Cultural Foundation. Please join me with this. welcome. <clears throat> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you so much, uh, Shakib. And uh, it's a real pleasure to see uh, such a full, lively young uh, Africans who are dealing and celebrating one of the most important, uh, for sure, of the last century uh, that uh, this continent has produced and the entire world. Uh, on behalf of the board uh, of the Red Sea Cultural Foundation, and uh, on behalf of the staff of the Hargeisa Cultural Center, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you. You as a, uh, a people who will be uh, talking tonight uh, and speaking about uh, Nelson Mandela and his legacy, but also uh, the list of the people, attendees that I see they are growing and most importantly, those uh, who are also uh, uh, following you guys uh, from uh, the social media and, and, and especially on the Facebook. Uh, it is certainly a comfort to see young people coming together from every corner of the continent and uh, uh, talking about the legacy of, uh, uh, of a man, but also for the entire generation. Uh, it's the 18th in Mandela Day, and uh, it's a, a day that uh, in every corner of the world, not only in Africa, people are celebrating that day, not just for the sake of celebration, but also to talk about uh, what uh, uh, is not going on well in this society. Nelson Mandela touched uh, every aspect, uh, every topic uh, of social life uh, or social order, uh, on education, on uh, inequalities, uh, all things that today seem to be uh, again and again coming back. So if you want to talk about any issue, you will be able to cite uh, a quote uh, set by Nelson Mandela. For that reason, he became a figure to celebrate. His birthday became a figure, a day to celebrate. But uh, what, as I said, uh, we are expecting from you, uh, young people of uh, this continent, uh, to also focus who betrayed the legacy of uh, Nelson Mandela and likes, who is not uh, delivering what uh, has been said, who uh, failed to respect uh, the legacy that has been set up. So uh, my role here is, is just uh, to welcome you, all of you and uh, uh, to uh, share how we are happy and we are eager to, to, to hear what you are saying today, what you are saying tonight, probably what you are saying in the morning for someone. And, and with that, uh, I would hand over again the microphone to Shakib. Thank you so much uh, for uh, organizing with your theme of Argesa Cultural Center. This is a wonderful event. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Chama. And for that, I will be introducing the speakers we have tonight for this discussion. Uh, first, uh, we are joined by Guled Ahmed Jama, who is uh, a lawyer by profession and women rights activist. Uh, he is also an, an alumni of Mandela Washington Fellowship in the USA. Uh, our second speaker will be Omnia Abbas Shokat, who is graduated with a bachelor's degree with biology with focus of environmental studies from the American University of Cairo in 2008. Uh, she has a master's in environment and resource management with focus on water and climate policy from the Fried University in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. 
Uh, she's also one of the co-founders, uh, one of the founders of Andrea Magazine, uh, which is bilingual digital multimedia cultural platform and cross-cultural enterprise. Andrea was launched in 2015 in Sudan and South Sudan, um, and then expanded into Uganda in 2018. Um, Omnia, uh, we, um, the Andrea has been um, recognizing as one of the top 10 women leading in tech in the Middle East and North Africa, and among the top 10 women tech innovators in Africa. Andrea has partnership with more than um, 30 regional cultural entities. Uh, we are also joined by John Igbonosa, who is a Nigerian youth motivator obsessed with building products that enhance the quality of life. Uh, he believes people should be equal uh, and should have equal access to opportunities that enable them to thrive and his desires and actions are channeled to enrich the gap, particularly in underserved communities, which he has worked with through several organizations. He is an alumnus of African Presidential Leadership Program, uh, a leadership program initiated by um, the, the president of Egypt in Al Fatah Al Zizi. Our last speaker uh, we, uh, will be Oba Ali, who is uh, graduated from Abarsi School 2015, uh, Mrs. Holis 2016, and currently doing her bachelor degree in political science with focus on international law at American University of Beirut. Um, Oba is a co-founder of Solace for Somali Land Girls, a foundation committed to eradicating all forms of FGM across communities in Somaliland through nutrition and environment. Oba was among the winners of the 2018-2019 resolution project. Uh, thank you all and Please welcome. And for that, we will we will uh, proceed our discussion. Um, I will hand over to the mic to our first speaker, who will be Guled Ahmed Chama. Guled will be focusing on uh, since he is a human rights activist, and Mandela has been voting the human rights uh, to honor human rights for uh, uh, sixty years. He will focus on on that area. How can African countries strengthen and overcome the human right um, the human right dilemmas in order to keep alive Mandela's vision of honoring people, no matter where they are, no matter where they are from, no matter who they are? So, Guled, please welcome. Um, thank you very much, and thank you to all the team and, and the Cultural Center for organizing this event. Uh, and happy Mandela Day, Madiba. Um, was a very good example of a good leadership in Africa. And he made possible that we could have a leadership that we could be proud of in Africa. So therefore, he redefined leadership in general, but that of in Africa. Uh, and he, he stands for that iconic leadership in Africa and all over the world. Unfortunately, we don't have many people uh, in the leadership positions in the continent acting upon the principles of Mandela. Which, uh, which are universal in terms of their applicability of humanity in general, but also which are which made possible with the South Africa, which witnessed apartheid, one of the greatest human violations that could occur anywhere on earth. He made possible that people living there to live together peacefully with humanity and dignity. He wasn't the person who was fond of revenge and retaliation. He wasn't the person who basically with those who had done wrong to him, uh, but he preferred all of the people in, in, in Africa, in South Africa, to live together in peace. That is the example he set, and that is the example we expect the leaders of the continent uh, to, to act upon, which they fail most of them to do. And that's very unfortunate. We are celebrating and marking a great man. Madiba was truly a great man in Africa and all over the world, uh, but in all the places we live in Africa, uh, we are not in, enjoying, you know, what he stood for. You know, in one hand, uh, I'm happy with what he stood for, and we'll be happy with that forever. In the other hand, I'm looking around the continent and saying, okay, are we having the kind of examples um, a deal of set for us? And I believe that's what's happening now on the ground.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Gulet, uh, for raising these important points. Indeed, Mandela was 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 uh, one of a kind of a leader that our continent and the entire world needs in order to survive and to make a world a better place to live in. Uh, I will uh, I will move to our second speaker who who will be Omnia. Omnia, please welcome. Uh, she will she will look at the discussion for another angle where she will focus on and concentrate how can as African youth amplify their voices especially youth and women and how can we establish networking while pursuing these goals and our own and own our own narrative. Please welcome Omnia. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the amazing and elaborative um, introduction. And I'm really happy to be amongst you. Um, I visited Somaliland last year, hosted by the Hargeisa Cultural Center and Dr. Jama and his team. And I have a very special place for Hargeisa and Somaliland at large and its people. Um, I want to, to put forth a few points that I find a bit um, troubling for me to to also really celebrate this day. Of course, we should celebrate him. Um, you know, Mandela was a huge figure for not just Africa, but the whole world. Um, but I also want to, to let us maybe dwell a bit about the idea of a legacy and how our narrative could really be completely stolen from under our feet if we don't do a good job of documenting it. And if we don't, even more importantly, do a good job of confronting our demons. Um, I want to, uh, to, to bring forward a very important point for me. It was only last year, um, actually, uh, uh, at, uh, it was uh, at the, the Carrot, the Carrot Co., which was in, in Kenya. They were showing a film about Winnie Mandela. And I was shocked to know that after years and years and years of work, really grueling, dangerous work on the ground while Mandela was in the prison, um, she was completely sidelined, she was humiliated, she was um, taken to court, she was completely ostracized by the movement, and sadly by Mandela himself. Uh, to me, this is a huge taint of his legacy because um, Winnie Mandela was, was a figure herself. She was a political figure, she was a feminist leader, and she was um, a grassroots movement builder. And to have all of that discredited by Mandela silently without even... Um, you know, confronting it and really talking about it in a way that uh, returns back some of the humiliation or, or some of the dignity to her. Um, that is a, a very problematic thing. And it's, it's consistent with male figures in history. And um, I think it's really important for me, not just as a feminist, but also as someone who's, who's talking about narrative consistently, that we have to talk about when we make mistakes. Accountability is really important, especially for our generation, because we have all these digital footprints all across the social media and the internet and the World Wide Web. And if, if we build on a narrative and if we build on a story about ourselves, but in our real life, there's another story, then that's fraud. And someone will call us on it and then we will have no place to turn. So I think it's really important for us as young people to now realize that we're under even more pressure than the generation of Nelson Mandela and those after him even between us millennials and, and Gen Z people who are completely tuned in online. Uh, and we have to hold ourselves accountable. We have to admit when we make mistakes and we have to be true to our message. We can't talk about equality on the street to the people on TV, on social media, while intimate equality is not happening or, um, or home equality is not happening or equity is not happening. And we're not staunchly advocating for it at home. Um, this is quite a big discussion now. And I think it affects us in it affects our, the, the credibility and the integrity of our narrative. Um, and if, if we continue to, to walk this thin line between um, confusion, having double standards, and um, not really living by our own um, uh, principles and values, then we will fail. We will fail, maybe not today, but we will fail in the future. And because we have all this footprint all across the internet, it's very easy for someone to, to um, trace it and call us a fraud. And I'm really scared for my generation because I see a lot of people being called off for being fraud for being liars, for, for plagiarizing works of art or plagiarizing works of scholarly um, academic production. 
etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so I really wanted to to sum my points um, I wanted us to to really think about the accountability of our actions to not have a double standard in our life and in our political careers or in our professional careers and to hold ourselves um, accountable with the standards that we aspire to lead on with um, and the last thing I wanted to say is even though we respect Nelson Mandela and his fight and what he did to his to um, the great nation of South Africa, we also don't have to treat legacies as untouchable um, stories. We can always go back and question some things, and um, especially if he was alive. Um, if, if the person is alive, it's a great way for, the, for them to make amends, to be asked about this legacy, to really make amends where um, this legacy could potentially be tainted in the future. Thank you so much. I'll just end here um, and wait for your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Omnia, uh, uh, for that for that uh, brilliant discussions, and also you have all, you have uh, looked at the, the the way we are just celebrating the Mandela's legacy on another angle, which is really very important to to look to look at it. Uh, and for that, I will I will I will uh, move to to invite our third speaker. Who will be John Igbonosa? Um, John, he will he will he will be responding on how can we utilize the human and the human capital and the potential of our African youth. We always had this kind of narrative of of, of telling us that the African youth are um, estimately about seventy percent of the African population. So how can we utilize this kind of potential? And um, as well, what will be their role of realizing the newly Africa Free Trade Agreement? John, please welcome. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Um, thank you for the privilege to be here. And um, I'm excited to represent Nigeria in this um, global conversation, which I believe that mm -hmm. A conversation of several youths um, together has the potential to form a basis for actionable movement after now. And I'm grateful to all of the administrators, everyone that placed this um, program, and um, to all of the panelists, uh, hoping, hoping to connect with everyone um, in soon time and every attendee that is listening. So the context discussion of um, Nelson Mandela is something I feel that um, should be very, you know, examined in terms of looking at the terms of human capital and the potentials that African youth hold um, as a race or a nation of its own. And so the truth is that um, looking at this, I, I would like to bring it from different angles, particularly with the concept of you know, civilization that is evident and even the COVID-19 that has formed an opportunity out of several limitations that we previously used to have. So looking at the potentials, I would first come out from the terms of saying that the COVID-19 has presented an opportunity that every African youth has the privilege right now to stand up from whatever limitations that we have, whatever challenges that we have, and even through technology, our voices can be heard. Maximizing the potentials or human capital as it were, I think many of us have to approach it from a very, um, you know, very important side of saying that we, like never before, we have a lot of opportunities where our voices can be heard through technology. And one thing that I believe that the feminist would really understand is how that technology has created, you know, has been able to fill a gap that normally you might not have filled if you were standing alone to fight. But through technology, you have the opportunity to reach out to quite a large number of people using the internet as a means. So um, looking at this, it's actually a very broad topic that, um, you know, if one begin discussing, you definitely will not be able to end, but I would like to pick it from two particular aspects, which I believe was very evident in the time of Nelson Mandela, which is in the terms of collaboration and positioning. So I believe that, you know, for youth, particularly in this generation, we have two major weapons as a tool to stand up and, you know, take hold of the economic um, opportunities that is amassing in Africa. And one of it is collaboration, seeing that how that collaboration is the new smart, um, how that you know you have one thing, another person has one thing, and we can all come together, bring up these beliefs together and make out something out of it. How that youth should begin to see that 
collaboration is the new smart. They must come out of whatever hidden places they are. We have gotten to a generation where you necessarily do not have to know everything, but you just have to know something about that major thing you know well. Collaborate with he who can also have of what you're doing and bring out something that would definitely what will change the lives of people. So I believe that if there was one thing that Nelson Mandela was able to maximize was collaboration. You know, and I don't want to delve into history, particularly because these are things that we can literally read online. Then on the terms of positioning, so I believe that whatever capacity you have, whatever skill you have, whatever talent you have, if in this particular period, we do not know how to position these things so that they can be found, then it means that what? It means that you are lighting up a candle under a bushel or you're lighting up a candle under a basket. So we as African youth must get to an extent where we understand collaboration and, and positioning as a vital tool in, in such a way that we can unnest the opportunities. And the African Free Trade Agreement that has been signed is one of the opportunities that this can be unnest. Because like I was telling some folks who I was talking with today, I said, we may literally not be able to affect the policies that are made or we may not be able to have so much impact on some of the decisions that are taken. But one thing I believe that we have the power to do is that as youth, we can position ourselves so that all of these benefits, all of the opportunities that is coming up, that is emerging, we can be positioned as entrepreneurs, as youth, in such a way that we can maximize all of these things for benefit. So if there are two major things that I would really like to talk about, I think I want to talk about the place of collaboration. Collaboration has helped us, particularly with the influx of technology. Right now, COVID-19 has showed us how that many people has to, you know, kill up the mentality of saying that I want to do everything online and coming online. And, and trust me, if I'm going to reference to a point that Omnia talked about, I would like to really talk about the part of technology because I'm currently working on Dravely and one of the vision of Dravely is we want to have a 60% female representation because we believe that there is just this dynamic way that ladies look at how things are done and make decisions. But the part I want to really bring out is the fact that I'm aware that in several African countries, many women are restricted to several things that they literally would have wanted to do. And if you realize most of these women, particularly young ladies, tend to become the breadwinner of their family. For example, like a house like mine, I grew up in a family where my mom was the dad and my dad was nowhere to be found. So you can understand what it looks like when I'm in a country that does not have technology as a means of doing trade. And women are not allowed to go out because somebody says they belong to the kitchen, another person says they belong to the bathroom, another person says they belong to the bedroom. And so with technology, with the influx of COVID-19, I believe that as youth, we can use all of these advancing opportunities to position ourselves for such benefits that we have. So if there are two things that I really want to sound as you know, like a large, a loud warning to everyone is collaboration and partnership and positioning. And we see this evidence in Nigeria. I was, I was checking up online today and I discovered that Nigeria is taking a decision to begin to, you know, create digital identity for everyone as a result of technology. And this is an opportunity that I feel that as African youth, we can form forces together. We can join hands together. We can fight together because trust me, friends, you don't have to know everything you just have to know one thing about that thing you know. Collaborate with somebody who knows what you don't know. See how that you can join forces together and make something out of what you can do. And I believe that, you know, the Africa we want is not something that can be gotten by just mere talks. The Africa we want is not something that can be gotten by mere motivation. Because trust me, motivation alone does not take it. I mean, entrepreneurship, I know what it looks like trying to build businesses in societies that are not enabling enough entrepreneurs to thrive. And I must tell you that collaboration is what we can employ as a powerful tool to win, um, particularly to position ourselves in the incoming African trade agreements that will be affected in several African countries. Yeah. So Thank you so much, think. John. Thank you so much, John. You have indeed phrased it very fascinating. Uh, going to see you have talked about how African youth need to harness the collaboration and partnership and positioning ourselves in a way putting to, to, to take advantage of these opportunities we have. And the last thing I, I took from your points was uh, using technology as a mean of trade, which is a really big point. Uh, thank you so much again. I will, I will move to our uh, fourth speaker, Ubah Ali. 
um, before before hand over to the mic to you, but um, I want you to look uh, at another point of the discussion, which would be um, the Nelson Mandela has has said before. Uh, freedom cannot be achieved unless women have been emancipated from all forms of oppression. Um, so from that, I want you to, 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 to focus on how, uh, how can we as African youth tackle and eradicate any form of uh, gender-based violence in order to create safe spaces for our people. Welcome, Uba. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for introducing me. That was a great introduction. Um, and it's a great day for all of us and happy Nelson Mandela Day. Um, so growing up, I always wanted to meet Nelson Mandela. He was one of my role models as a young girl. Um, and the day he died, it was devastating, honestly, because I always had like one time I would meet Nelson Mandela because I believed in his values. I believed in his mission and his basic principles. So Nelson Mandela's legacy remained to be with us until today. Um, but you could see as like when you see the image of the African continent as a whole, I feel like we failed to protect and to pursue the dream of Nelson Mandela because Nelson Mandela dreamed of Africa that's independent. Africa that's independent from foreign intervention, from foreign aid. And in general, now Africa became the graveyard of foreign intervention and also um, foreign aid. And it's something that we should be ashamed of as an African youth and also an, as an African leaders. Uh, because I believe in the Africa that Nelson Mandela wanted to, his grandchildren to live in 100 years or like us to live, it's, it's, it's falling apart. And I think we need to revive that um, legacy and we need to revive the, the basic principles and which were like embedded with resilience that Nelson Mandela had because he spent 20, 27 years in jail and he did that so he, we can be safe. So we can leave the Africa that he envisioned, envisioned like a long time ago. So when it comes to um, honestly like women, uh, women's rights in, in Africa, I feel like there are so many African countries that do not take women's rights in general as a, something that they usually enforce. They have it in their constitution, but what, what do they do? with that because there is no um, enforcement mechanism that that you know that enforces women's rights to be protected that's why there are so many women in africa right now that are like that are suffering that do not go to school young children are, are outside of school because of cultural norms because of uh, of the you know the expectations of of like of them being belong to the kitchen or be, being a housewife. So why do we still have that? And personally, I believe that a nation will not develop at all until they free and protect the rights of women. That's the most important you know, element that I believe. If a country wants to develop, they have to invest women and they have to protect the rights of women. So I am from Somaliland and in this century, right now, up to today, 98% of the young girls who live in Somalia go through female genital mutilation. Why do we still have that? Why do we still practice that? We, have, we always claim to be a very democratic country, but if we are not protecting the rights of those young girls, especially now because of COVID-19, girls are not going to school because the schools are closed. So a lot of girls are being cut we have to question and see and empower our, our young girls because at the end of the day, when they get the education they need, they will be a good mother. When they get the education they, they envision to have, they will be a transformative leaders and they will change something about the country system. But if we always neglect and dehumanize their ability and their potential, well, in my opinion, Somaliland will not reach nowhere because half of their population are living under that stigma. And if we wanna live 
and carry on the, the, the legacy of NASA Mandela, we have to empower our young girls. We have to empower women because when we empower women, we also empower their, like, the, we empower them to be a good mothers and to raise their children in, in, a, in a way that they, they know actually what their children are up to. But how can we do that? How can we end the gender-based violence, forced marriage, sexual assault, rape and so on how can we end that we can end that by educating and empowering our young girls this is where it starts and when we do that we will see a progress a change might not come in a day or two days but 30 years from now on six years from now on we will see that change but as long as we are neglecting and 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 not caring about women's rights well, we will not reach nowhere, as I said before, because I believe in women's rights is also a human rights issue. And if we, if we don't care about a part of our society and we see them, like we see girls who are being forced to marry someone that they don't want, we see girls who are being raped. For example, in Somaliland, we see that young girls are being raped and like some couple of elders will talk and then they will just negotiate. Nobody will care about the, the, the well-being of that girl. Nobody will care about the future of that young girl. So how can we end that? We have to use our critical thinking and we have to raise our voices as a young generation. Because if all of us as a youth work together, I feel like something would have changed. If one, 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 young, one girl gets raped, we have to protest. We have to like demand our justice. And as a men and women and everyone, if we care about each other, if we care about the well-being of your neighbor, the well-being of your sister, well, we will change something. And Nelson Mandela dream South Africa being free. So we can also dream the fact that we can make a change in 30 years. And when we do that, we also lift each other and we also lift the legacy and the future of so many young women in Africa, because that's, when the Africa that we all dream of will happen. When we take care of one another and when we protect the rights of young girls and women and together we will succeed. And African women should work together and this, they should like um, destroy and, and raise their voice and come together and negotiate together and like, you know, be open about what's happening between them because that's how we can create a great connection and we can create a platform that women feel that they are empowered and that they could raise their voice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Abba, for this uh, wonderful words. You have uh, talked about how a nation in need to empower, educate, free, and infest the women in order to develop and, and, and and I believe, and I totally agree with you that one side of the community cannot solve this uh, this issue. We need to come um, to come together, women, youth, elders. We need to come together to find a solution for this for this uh, for this kind of uh, disaster. We can't say it's a problem; it's more of a disaster. And thank you so much again. Um, I will I will go back to Guled, um, and and my question for you will be, uh, what are the uh, social, political, and contextual factors that prevent the African youth from realizing these values? Yeah, that, that is a there's a that's a quite a big question. There are a lot of challenges in the continent, and. and uh, the number is say 75, 70 to 65% of the population in the continent are under the age of 35. And Africa is the youngest continent. There's a huge potential, you know, people are getting educated, people are questioning the status quo and how the country is, or the continent has been run by our leaders. But also the relations between the South and the North. Uh, the continent has been suffering from colonialism and post-colonial colonial, uh, uh, maybe imperialist uh, to, 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 to say so, but at least the dependency to the, to the West and the imbalance and the global inequality, where the, where the global North has huge influence. 
And we are part of a global system as Africa where we were not part in this innovation at the beginning. For instance, the UN was created while Africa was under the colony. And the UN is the one that decides much of what we do in the continent, the UN Security Council, which is a very undemocratic institution. The lack is African uh, seat uh, in this permanent institution. Therefore, the, the, young, the, young, the younger generation of the continent is up to these realities. And the global system, also in a continental level, and in the country specific problems. Uh, if we become cognizant of these realities and face it in a critical aspect, not accepting the status quo, not becoming lenient to corrupt leaders who are ruling our country for their own economic and personal interests, but trying to initiate a democratic process and democratic principles that is compatible to, 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 our, to our problems in Africa, to our cultures and everything, we could overcome. But with network and pan-Africanism, I believe if we try to, to solve our problems only by country uh, specific aspect, we will not be able to do that. We need to, to, to cooperate and to coordinate the continent and you know, reinforce the ideas of pan-Africanism. Africa is a very complicated place today. With the large integration, neighbors cannot trade one another. It is easier to trade with China and the West rather than two neighboring African countries to trade with. Is the East is blocking from the West. So we are having this problem. And these are not natural disasters. These are man made, uh, human made, rather to say, problems which we can overcome by questioning what is happening in our continent and setting aside in our internal facilities created by forces imposing upon us uh, by, by colonial powers. So we are having, we are facing a lot of problems here and there, but we cannot overcome unless we, 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 we address it. In a new, new approach that takes us to what you call in trans transformation, and that's what I believe you know, the positive aspect of Mandela stood for. Uh, he left the office in a democratic process so that South Africa could remain democratic. But look at the rest of the continent. We have we are having leaders who don't want to leave office. You know, we, we now we have Eritrea. Eritrea is today at, at the news. But Abiy Ahmed isn't there. But the president there has been there how many years since the independence of Eritrea? Can, is it possible to have uh, a pet horn of Africa, a democratic person of Africa? We do have dictators of that sort. So how do we um, address these issues? Not by country specific, not handling Ethiopia problems, but regional and non continental issues. So what I would like to answer to your question is that we are having many political, social, and economic problems that we could overcome if we become united as an Africans and try to get solutions for our problems because the problem of Africa is the African problem. Solutions are not in New York and Geneva. Solutions should be in, in, in Addis Ababa uh, and Johannesburg or Hargeza, whatever other capital we have in the continent. Thank you so much, Gulet, uh, for raising these uh, brilliant points. Um, and as, as someone said before, the greatest threat to our Africa is the belief of waiting that someone else could come and save our continent. It's not true. We, I agree with you, we need, uh, and Africans need to solve their problems and not to wait the external but to come and save our, and solve our problems. Uh, I would ask the, um, this um, question to Omnia. Omnia, do you, do you want do you want me to repeat the question or you get it? Sure, um, you can repeat the question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The question was, uh, what are the social, um, political and contextual uh, factors that prevent the African youth realizing these values in our communities? So um, just to add to the point of Goled, um, it's really important for us to also re revisit our history and make sure that we understand that shortfalls are natural, they're normal, they're humane, um, but we also really need to hold ourselves accountable for the ways that we were um, also used in certain ways as, as Africans to portray certain stereotypes to also push for a larger agenda. Um, and to kind of try breaking that down into smaller facts that we could change 
as a generation specifically and try to get to know each other a little bit better. I think like it's really disheartening to know that a lot of you know people cannot really move between borders. So I'm hoping that you know in the near future the African Union would would enact something like that so people can move a bit more freely within the continent instead of needing visas to do everything. And this this sense of of collectivity, this sense of um, union that we as Africans have the same plight and we face some of the challenges that were um, enacted on certain parts of the pl of the continent were also in other parts um, and to share the learnings from the processes like for example Sudan is one of these countries that was and has been embroiled in war for decades there was a war that led to the secession of South Sudan and I see a South Sudanese brother um, in the comments as well hello to you um, so this is a huge lesson for us to, to understand. Um, do we ostracize people to the extent that they want to break out and start their own country? There are separationist um, movements in all over Sudan because we're fighting on one end, Darfur, on the other end, the east, the other end, southern Sudan, the Nuba Mountains. Um, and, and there's got to be a national dialogue and there's also got to be an Africa-wide dialogue. Maybe we need to revisit the colonial uh, borders and think of more of the community ties that bind people across borders. Or as I said, maybe solve the whole issue by opening up the borders so people don't have to feel like I'm from the country and not the other and I can't move and I can't um, do, you know, have my livelihood the way I want to. Uh, so I think mobility and just the, the, the kind of closed up borders are quite a big problem for Africa. Um, it also means that different communities do not understand the challenges within the different communities um, next to them. And we really need to have bigger, broader conversations. This is one of the reasons I really love the Hargeza Cultural Center because um, it really brings people from different parts of the continent to just kind of engage. And when people engage, bright ideas come up. Um, and that's one of the things I really love about the kind of work that I do. I literally get on a plane and I, and I go and explore. And from that comes, you know, building businesses, build, building teams, building cross-cultural projects. Um, and that's really one of the ways we can fix this isolation problem. The other way um, I think is to also really nurture arts and culture. Um, it's looked down on in our societies. You know, arts and culture is always looked at that, that industry that people do because they could not excel in math or, or in engineering or in medicine, but that's not true. This is something that people have to master. It's a skill, it's, it's, it's a expertise, um, it's, it's theory, it's practice. It's just as, um, uh, as respected, as, as challenging, as um, contributing to the economies as other sectors. So I think we need to do a complete overhaul on the arts and, 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 and culture sector in all of Africa. I think it's having a bit of a, of a good moment right now. Publishing is booming, Netflix Africa is here. And not that that's a great thing, but it is what it is. Um, we can go into that in another discussion. Uh, but you know, music is beautiful these days. It's crossing borders. We have um, African streaming. Um, mobile applications, we have African icons of, of music now making it to top charts. So this is all great on, on a grand scale, but we also need to nurture it on a continental level and not wait for the outside world to say, oh, this is nice. Why not we say that this is nice and we, we embrace it and we nurture it and we push it further so that people in this industry feel like they're appreciated and they could um, openly contribute to the economy and, and really uh, we would get a um, quite an elevated number of people who would join the industry and um, be able to represent the cultures better, be able to create uh, cross-cultural ties better, um, be able to um, you know create another success story like Nollywood, for example. Um, the last point I want to I want to talk about is um, African women and African men. We need to have a serious conversation about all the different transgressions that are happening between the men and the women. And I think my colleagues here talked plenty about it. Um, you know, it's a huge discussion. We can't really narrow it down to a subsection of a webinar, uh, but it's, it's a huge discussion. And we really need to talk about um, just not just the home level, um, you know, transgressions that happen and, and violence and, and inequality. 
which then translates into our communities and our societies and our countries being places where inequality, where violence, where um, standards are applied differently to men and women. Um, women are equally as energetic, as able, as smart. We don't need to prove this. I mean, it's, it's really quite there. But it's a matter of implementing that, that respect. You can't just respect women and say, you know, you're great and sit down. You have to actively partake in elevating women, putting them in places of power, um, empowering with skills, um, giving them the, the freedom to move around um, and the free, freedom to, to, to pursue whatever they want. Um, and removing all these bad habits and bad practices that hold women back that um, make them feel like they're inferior, make them feel like they have to be protected and shielded from the world because they're fragile and they're gentle. I'd like to say that we're not, we're really not. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just cap it at uh, those three things. Um, so the first thing is mobility. We need to get to know each other as a continent. The second thing is um, we need to support the arts and culture sector. And the third is we need to have a real conversation about men and women um, in our communities and also at the level of the house. I'll leave it at there. And I'm hoping you'll give us time to answer some questions because I think there's one that's um, directed to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Omnia. Of course, you, you will get a time to answer these questions asked by our attendees and the Q&A focus in the webinar. Um, thank you so much. I will, I will, I will, I will remove our, our next speaker. Um, Tom, um, I will ask you this um, same question I have asked you and Omnia. Um, you want me to repeat the question? You have listened before. Yes, please. I would, I would appreciate you to um, repeat the question. Then I guess there are some backgrounds somewhere, somehow. That is um, affecting, yeah, your voice. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So I can uh, yeah okay. The question is uh, what are the social, political, and contextual factors that prevent in African youth to realize these values in our communities? And 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 please uh, do it as as quick as possible. Thank you. Okay. So. Um, I think it's like a very interesting question that um, as African youth, we must really examine uh, when it comes to the context of development, particularly economically, which I think is one of the focus of my conversation from the basis of entrepreneurship. So first of all, I feel that um, I'm um, looking at it, I feel it's basically a background thing, which I don't want to delve into. But if you look at the way that um, Africa, you know, with the colonial era, what we went through with, you know, with colonialism from the Western world, and right now what we have neo-colonialism, like what Omani was trying to say, where many people, even here in Nigeria, it happens a lot. People will tell you that they literally like somebody who is fair skinned or light skinned than somebody who is dark. Do you understand? So like this, this literally still lives in our society, and and it's I would rather I would, I would say it's 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 in between self-identity, inferiority complex, sometimes when we look at this on a very internal um, level. But I, I don't want to talk about the challenges because I feel like we read about all these things every day in, in the news. I feel what I, I'm here to discuss is the solution. So the first thing I would like to first say is that we need to understand that everyone is, um, everyone has a particular skill that is distinct to them. And we just must understand how to unnest these skills and make a change in our society. So like what I was trying to say previously is we definitely may not be able to know everything. I wish I could do everything, but somehow I cannot just do everything. So it's, it's about finding the right um, um, hole to place in the knot and tie them together. So um, yes, we know there are lots of challenges. Yes, we know that there are all of these issues. My job is not to come and tell you that these issues are existing because you read about all of these things in the news every day. My job is to look at this and say, okay, what can I do as a solution to this and how can we solve this? So the first thing is, let's look at how that in between ourselves, right? We can appreciate the little that we have, you know? And one thing I love about Africa is there are lots of challenges that still needs to be solved. It's not like Silicon Valley where what we call major solutions here are class works or assignments in some of the institutions to do. So I believe that we can really get busy with solving our problems than getting to complain about them because yes, we cannot deny 
that these problems exist in the society. Then um, in cases where we have places where government can be much of a challenge or so social cultural issues, because sometimes the truth is you may not be able to avoid some cultural issues from happening. These are generational things that happen even before some of us were born. So it's literally going to take like what Uba was saying that um, you you would you would not it's the change is not going to happen so suddenly it's going to go over a period of time where gradually gradually change begins to come in and people begin to adjust to um, you know the new smart and like what Omani is doing with young girls uh, leaders generally you know getting to like imprint these values into them so what I would just say is we must not um, we must not um, you know. We must not allow the government to deprive us of some of the steps we want to take. Sometimes it could literally not be their fault. Sometimes it could just be the technicality of taking some particular decisions and whatever the case might be. But that's why I think I'm one of the very strong advocates of technology and the power that technology has, you know, to, to help us. Yeah, so I, I think that's basically what I want to say on this for now. Yes. Um, thank you so much, John, uh, for, for your um, fascinating bits of praising uh, to us is how can African youth be able um, to join and participate in these kind of movements of realizing these values uh, by taking advantage of, of the technological innovations. Um, I, will, I, I will move to our um, last speaker, Ubah. Um, let me let me let me say let me re um, repeat the question as as my my give you another another uh, time to focus and answer it. Um, the question says what are the social and uh, political and contextual factors that prevent in these values uh, that that prevent in African youth to realize these values in order like like we know that as an African youth we didn't. Um, realize or achieve what Mandela was fishing. Uh, so what are these things that holding us back? Welcome, Uba. Uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to say um, as a youth, I think we're never given uh, the platform to use our critical thinking and to to be held accountable or to at least get the trust that we can make a change. Uh, because I feel like why can't we as a youth try um, to uh, maybe like be a revolutionary, create a revolutionary movement so we can change something. But because our leaders never trusted us, they put us in this um, small box. And then like we were told that you belong to this um, environment. So you can't say something that can be critical when it comes to your leaders or when it comes to those people who, who control you. And I believe in, as an African youth in general, we never had the connection to create a strong bond among us. And uh, so we can trust each other. We can, I, I can trust someone who's from Tunisia or from South Africa or from, I don't know, Botswana. Like we never had that connection. So we were always, even our education system is still, based on colonialization, you get me? So like when I am studying in school, I learn about um, the French Revolution and, and, and what was happening in the US, but I never learned what was happening my, ne my next neighbor. I don't know anything about Ethiopia, nor Tanzania. So even our education system doesn't give us the value um, and, and, and you know the, 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 the skills to be connected to our African um, continent. Um, and even our leaders, you might say, oh, Africa is an independent continent, but I believe in we are not an independent continent, honestly, because our leaders are politically, economically, and ideologically still colonized, so to say, by the West. So the fact that our leaders are not even trusting each other, the fact that we don't know African scientists. If I tell you right now, name an African scientist, I bet we don't know any African scientists. We don't know like many things about what's happening about you know our continent we always associate our education system and our, our way of thinking to the west 
And I think we have to decolonize our education system. We have to learn our history, as Omna said, and, and also Gule. Like, we have to create that connection and that dialogue so we can trust each other. Because if there's no trust, well, Africa will still be colonized mentally. You might say we are independent, but independence, still IMF and World Bank controls you. So you are telling me you're independent. So I, I feel like as a youth, we have to be, we have to make a, um, we have to be a revolutionary so we can change the image of Africa and we can have that trust and that bond that, um, that you know, that combine our vision and, and, and the legacy of Nansa Mandela. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much Ubah, uh, for, for this uh, burning and brilliant points. Uh, indeed, our Africa that is in our heart, the Africa we went is Africa that's free from everything, that's free from foreign hand or foreign investment. And that's um, exactly borderless that you can freely take a bicycle and go to all the way to Hargeisa, to Dhaka, Senegal. And, 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 and that needs that we as Africa youth, our leaders, you know, might not give us the, the platform or the space that we need to, to expose our critical thinking, but we need to own and to take them as, as, as we move forward. Thank you so much. Um, now we will go to uh, the questions asked by our attendees in the webinar. The first question goes to Omnia. Um, the question says, how can we balance celebrating the legacy of our heroes while being critical of some of the action ideas from Mohammed Ahmed via email. Great, thank you so much for this question. And I think um, my friend Uba here started answering it. Um, it's, a, it's an important question. Why don't we know our scientists? Why don't we know, you know the innovators, the um, the people who are doing really great things at, at different levels and uh, across different sectors, uh, because history is not really writing their names. I think this is the, the responsibility of, of everyone um, in the media sector, in, in sector which um, actively try to bring people to the front, like the Hargeisa Cultural Center, um, to really document people and not just names. Let's write their stories. Let's write um, you know, where they started from, what their inspiration was, where do they as aspire to go to. And um, I love reading, you know, lists like, um, you know, the top 10 African uh, whatever uh, by Forbes. But why Forbes? Why is Forbes the one collecting these, these people and creating lists for them? Um, there's one by OK Africa. Um, I believe they had one, uh, the, the, top 10 the top 100 African women that they ran this year and I believe the year before as well. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful list, people from every walk of life, uh, from every um, sector. But again, there's quite a big bias here because who's online? That's the big one. Um, and online means that they have electricity, they have, they're in a place which has power, they can afford electricity, they have some sort of, of device that connects them to the internet. They can afford the internet. Um, they can afford to use it excessively to the point where they they can be tra tracked and traced. So there's a huge, huge, huge gap between people, the internet, and documentation. And this is a big question for us. Where do we even start? Where do we start to find people? And where do we start to, to document them in a way that is fair and not just um, you know, elitist or um, just a technologist from a technologist point of view. Um, so this is, it's, it's a big task. It's not a small task. And Mandela did not reach this, uh, you know, glamour um, sort of level of, of knowledge and, 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 and appreciation um, without, you know, 27 years in prison. So hopefully we don't need to do that as youth, but we also need to uplift each other and tell each other stories. Like I, I run a publication, so I have a duty to always find people who may not be found, as well as also when people can be found to make sure that they're amplified. Um, anyone who's working in, in a sector which um, gives them access to different populations like refugees, like IDPs, like people um, in, in, in you know, underprivileged 
economic situation, get them, get their stories, make sure that they're not forgotten, they're not, they're continuing to be part of our of our current history. Um, and the other thing is is also we we can celebrate people, we can celebrate the legacy, but we also need to be conscious of who wrote that history and what was the purpose of it. As also Ubah was saying that. Um, we are pretty much colonized in the way that our education system is, in the way that our leadership and governance is run. Um, just being aware of these things would give you a more um, heavier approach to, to appreciating things, not to take things for face value, to always question, to always go digging. So if you're looking for someone, don't go to the first Google document or the first Google page search, search page, sorry. Go to the 10th one. What is the other side saying? What are people whose voices were kind of subdued by history saying about this person? And always do your research better to understand any person's entire complex life. I don't expect Nelson Mandela to be perfect, but I also expect that he could use his platform to reach perfection as much as possible and not omit certain important things um, like his wife's humiliation by the party. Um, uh, just reading the question one last time. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I, I said what I can about this. Thank you so much again. <laughs> I, wish, I hope you will you will remember as we as we move forward. Thank you so much, Omnia. Uh, um, I have a question to Gulet. Um, which, this question is from uh, Muhammad. The question says, "What is the greatest thing that?" Somaliland leaders can learn from Mandela. Please welcome. Uh, thank you. I think what Somaliland leaders and, and the leaders of the continent in general can learn from Mandiba uh, was to uh, what's been coined as to become servant leaders, leaders who serve and work for the people in full, but not leaders who work in front of people. Therefore, you need leaders to put themselves as, not as forces who rule oppressively over people, but servants who are assigned by the people to do specific work for a specific period of time. Therefore, it's, it's working for your country within, within that period of time as best as possible, but also leaving office when your time term is over. Uh, and, and these are the two things I think we, we can learn from, from Madiba in Africa. Uh, he was, you know, being a kind leader, um, not becoming oppressive to your people, um, not uh, preferring retribution, but also uh, to give you a good example, um, Madiba came in power and, and he was loved by his people and the world of what he has done, but he didn't insist in staying uh, the power uh, as Mugabe did. Mugabe was freedom fighter as well. He, he did a great job as, as Madiba. But he failed to leave office and preserve for his people. But being a freedom fighter doesn't make you good. What makes you good is how you act when you get the freedom, when you rule over people. Do you oppress people as your predecessors did, or do you lead the way and work for your people? And I think that's what our leaders will learn from Somalia. Now, for instance, our president, Musabihi, his former rebel commander who fought against rebellion, uh, had against the dictatorship, and now he is in power. What we expected from him is not to do the same his predecessor did. It. What we expected from him is to lead the way and to become servant, kind to his people, respect to human rights and constitutionalism, and then leave power on his demands. Um, thank you so much, Gulet, uh, for, for explaining and pointing out what kind of leader has Somaliland uh, Republic needed in order to survive and, and be part of. And, and remain the Somaliland we want by our hearts and, our, and, and each and every Somalilander. Uh, I have another question for, um, this question goes to John. I hope you can hear me. It's from uh, Achikobi, um, he's from Nigeria. The question says, I realized one problem that African youth have is identity crisis and born knowledge of our history. So how can we salute and or how can solution to solve this be a very inclusive in our system and not just by initiatives? Please welcome John. 
Okay, so the first thing I would like to say is I would like to really buttress on um, what Omnia was talking about um, in terms of when you're searching online, who when you're trying to search for something that has happened in the past, who wrote these things, um, what source and whatever. Because I'm privileged to study um, history and international relations uh, for my first degree. So I must really tell you when you get to study about you know the African history, um, how colonialism came into Africa and all of these things, you will see how that there were several spaces in those history where many things were removed from it. And it's so evident, it made it appear like we were the one who literally begged for them to come. We literally gave them our lands. We literally want them to stay. And you know, many of all of these things. But when you discover, you discover that this was written by a Western writer and obviously what do you expect subjective you know additions in such stories so i i, I think mm -hmm. what i would just rather say is I, I think it's just the best time for um many people to rise and begin to really document their history um of the truth uh, when he talks about um you know liberating ourselves it's, it's a gradual process it's something we have to discipline ourselves to do intentionally and i would not lie to you see when these guys came, they, they showed the mirror, particularly in Benin, here in Nigeria, and they bought many of us because we had never seen the mirror in our lives. Now, see, this thing, when it, it, it's not just going to suddenly stop overnight because these were things that happened to our four parents. So right now, you can still see traces of all of these things, even when we take pictures, how people want to treat their skin, um, you know, several privileges and whatever that has to do with our country. So I'd rather just say that we have to just place very intentional um, discipline to documenting things down. And I think that's like a major challenge when it comes to data. I feel like Africa has not really prioritized data as it were. We don't, we don't really have data when it comes to data for whether businesses or data for this or data for that. When you check four to five different websites, you'll be seeing different things and you see that this information are not equal or at least almost equal. So it tells you that the way we gather information in Africa and the way we process and deliver this information is still not yet effective. So I think we need to really pay attention to that. Then we need to also go back to like the cradle, like most of these guys in junior schools, like colleges. Um, I, I myself and a team, we, we, we build games. And one of the games that we build is um, a game to a board game to teach people about Nigerian history by playing a board game. And what we envision to do is build this game around Africa. So to document stories of every major African leaders in the past, whether male or female, on board games this time, so that whether you have light or there's no light, or whatever the case might be, electricity, as it were, you have access to play games and really like learn from the history of your land. So I think we just need to really uh, put more efforts in the media celebrate those people who are making making efforts to to the right things and yes i think that's just the beginning to the end it definitely might not end in one day and it won't but gradually i think it will definitely end yes thank you so much john uh i will i will move to our next question for over question says um while it's true that mandela envisioned a continent which Independence and free from interventions of, of the so called international community through aid and the like. It was also about uh, empowering the brotherhood and standing with each other, then hating each other. So, how do you see the xenophobic attack on each other as we Africans are attacking other Africans? Please welcome. Thank you so much. Um, also, the prayer call is happening, so I think you can you can still hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, very well. Um, so um, that's a really good question because there's so much hatred and there's so much um, I don't know tension uh, between the Africans. And how can we solve that? Because if there is no, as I said before, if there is no trust, if we don't understand uh, the commonality of our history. Um, well, we will still uh, fight and, 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 and I don't know, fight over resources because we have still that identity crisis. The fact that we embrace the white man 
and we are always against our brothers and sisters that we live and share the same continent. I think that's something that we have to um, unveil and understand first through our education, as I said, we have to um, decolonize our education system. We have to understand our history because, for example, I, I took a course um, and about, um, it's called Politics of the Sea. And that course was about, you know, the sea and how uh, there's so much tension in the sea. And I, like, we learned the, 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 the history of piracy. And for me, honestly, even though I am Somali, and I supposed to know uh, Somali piracy and more about that. Still, I had this negative image about Somali pirates because I did not, because all I used to hear was, you know, the negative image of social media and how the West portrays the Somali fishermen or the Somali pirates to, to be like, you know, these guys with a gun and, you know, they are harassing and, you know, fighting with other like shipmen. So, like that class, I actually learned, you know, the history of piracy, and I learned how there's no the voice of the Somali fishermen and also the voice of the Somali pirates are not even in academia. So always the, the their history and their image is always right by the West, and the media doesn't focus on the Somali, you know, see and how um, those other countries are taking advantage of. And even if you ask maybe a lot of Somali people about their piracy and their perspective towards them, it will be still a negative image because they, all they see is, you know, how the West told them that a Somali pirate is supposed to look like. So I think we, it's time that we have to understand our own identity, where we came from, um, you know, what caused, you know, the, the, the lack of connectivity between the Africans. And I think at that time when we realized our mistake is when we realize that we are embracing and we are being brainwashed by others. I think that's the sign that we will understand more about our history, more about you know what we share in common. And we can the fact that even Gulet said the fact that when there is an issue in in, in somewhere in the African uh, continent, they always take the issue to the West. Do we need that? No. Why do we have an African Union? Why do we have government? Why do we have like, I don't know, so many institutions if we cannot solve a simple problem that an African country or like two African nations are facing. So like colonization is still there and we have to be um, visible and, and always see um, where the issue is coming from. And our African leaders, I always blame them and I always blame also the youth because the fact that we are not questioning the African leaders and we are always just, you know, we always go to the, the way they, they tell us to go. So I think African leaders should be held accountable. And, and even I am a feminist and I always talk about how African leaders who betray and who are sexist and who, are, who believe misogynistic idea about women should be held accountable because when we always deny the fact that, you know, some leaders are so sexist and we embrace their good side, we are still denying that image of them. So we have to be critical to our leaders and we have to understand our history and what we share in common. That's what I always say. Um, thank you so much, Uba. Uh, I, will, I will move to our next uh, speaker. This question goes to Omnia. It's from Hamsi. The question says, do you think that it's the right time for African youth to move away from celebrating older figures and make names for their own? The answer is yes, <laughs> of course. Um, <clears throat> I think also there's a problematic um, issue with the older figures always having to do with war, um, independence, like quite traumatic experiences actually. So I think it's it's quite important to start building different things like, I don't know, an African who invented something or um, a writer who, who won an award or someone who started a center that trained you know, women or youth onto things for them to then be able to self-sustain themselves and, and grow on to other um, domains. So I think also the definition of who to celebrate and why we celebrate them um, has to change. We need to stop thinking of um, the politicians as the only class that can have actual effect on society. Yes, they do, 
but there's other classes that do, there's other domains, sorry, um, that do other sectors, other actors. Um, and we need to really revisit our, our history and how it's written and be very critical about it. Um, one um, really striking effect was, um, I was part of this Feminist Institute last year in October, and we were asked to identify a, a couple of feminists for every era. So just people we knew about, everyone from like Nefertiti, Hatshepsut, um, uh, you know, just different eras, and then all the way until I believe 1950s, so nothing new. So of course we knew all the 1950 plus plus until now, uh, we knew those icons, we know, the, we know that those feminists who still make waves until today, the ones who just passed and so on. But we couldn't think of the ones in the 1700s, the 1800s, the uh, 1600s, etc. And the lesson there was there were so many amazing women who did amazing things for the communities that were the, the unsung heroes. And I think it's the same thing for men, um, because history really glorified people in a way that was very political and very war um, induced. So it was all about winning a war, winning a conquest, whatever um, kind of context that it was, um, but it had to do with conflict and violence. And I think we need to really rethink that, especially that um, we're the post-World War II generation. And um, even though we still have a lot of internal conflicts in our continents and in uh, our continents and in our countries, um, but we need to start waging a, a peace um, kind of dominant narrative about you know, the people we celebrate. So that it's also a motivational thing for people who, who want to enter different domains other than politics to also excel where they go, to master the skills for where they are. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we should absolutely start celebrating younger people of our generation or the previous generation and not just focus on historical figures or um, you know, people born before 1950, for example. Um, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. Yeah, very well. Like, like one just quick question, which, which, which all of you will be answered. Like, if you happen to meet Mandela, what would you ask him? Omnia. Oh, this is really tough. Um, I would ask him if if he's satisfied where with where African descendants in South Africa are right now. Just, um, I'm not an expert uh, when it comes to how Africans in South Africa are living, um, but what I know is that things are not, you know, good. And <clears throat> I would ask him, um, you know, if he's satisfied with that and what he could have done differently um, and I would definitely bring up the issue of extreme xenophobia in South African communities uh, that other Africans suffer from. And I remember listening to a song um, with my friend, it was by a Somali singer, and he was basically cussing out South Africa, saying, you know, you guys are xenophobic, I hope you this, I hope, I mean, I don't condone that kind of hate and that language, but it seems like it was coming from a place of experience. So, and I know a lot of people who feel that way about South Africans and South Africa. Um, so I wonder this, this African on African hate, you know, where did it come from and, and, and how did that get missed even though he's such a revered and, and respected figure in African um, in, on the continent itself. So these would uh, be the two things that I would ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much again, Omnia. Um, I will ask this question to Guled. Um, if it happens to meet Mandela, what would you ask him? Yeah, I think one question goes as the one else on the said, like, you know, what went wrong? You know, I was in South Africa very recently and the inequality is so deep, you know, still the white minority controls the economy, politics, you know, you will go there and you see true South Africa, uh, the fact people live in a, in a very horrible life. And I would ask him what went wrong. You did a good job, but what is, what's going on there? Uh, and I think that this is an important question to be asked, even the leadership, current leadership in, in South Africa, which is ANC, they're running the country and the deep, the inequality is so deep. But another question I would have asked him is, you know, how we can make our leaders better? You know, we, we, we have this problem, wherever you go in Africa, our leaders are so bad. You know, either they are dictators or what I call democratically elected dictators. They came in power in a democratic means, but they sit and sit and they act as dictators, you know, 
they, they access the democracy procedurally, but some necessity they don't, they don't care about that. And we are having that problem in, in the entire continent of Africa. I think Ghana may be a little bit exceptional, but the rest of the continent is having that same problem. Um, thank you, Guled. Um, Oba, please welcome to, to answer this same question. If you have been to Mandela, what would you ask him? I think um, I would have asked the same questions as Omenia and Guled would have asked, but also I would have asked him um, his view about African Union, because honestly, I believe in African Union is like, it's not working at all, like not working at all, but like it's not, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So I would have like asked him like, what can we do better? And how can we strengthen uh, the role of the African Union so they can um, function and do what they're supposed to do? Thank you so much for, for this quick and, 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 and brilliant answer. Um, John, please welcome to, to answer this question. Um, the same question I asked with our colleagues. Okay, so um, if there were two questions that I'm going to really ask Nelson Mandela right now, the first one would be um, about the xenophobia, the xenophobic issue that is going on in South Africa um, alongside um, the dominance of the whites, you know, because the white dominance in South Africa is still quite prevalent. So why, why wasn't he able to, you know, totally shift the power over to um, the South Africans themselves? And um, my second question would definitely be, what possible collaboration right now can we form? Because I think my major point of conversation has been on collaboration. So what possible collaboration can we form in such a way that uh, we can effectively maximize the African trade, free trade agreement that is coming up right now that will benefit every party without losing out on the one? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, John. And now we will we will move to our last question before I hand over to to Eid Hassan, who is the project manager of the Argisa Cultural Center, and he will wrap up. Um, I I I wish and I hope that all of you will be quick as quick as possible. The question says, what are the or what is the one thing that you are doing uh, personally that can foster to achieve these values? I will, I will give first to Omnia. I think, I think I will, I will, I will hand over to Gullet to answer this question and then Omnia will join us. Yeah, I, I work on human rights issues and I, and I believe it is one of the values Nelson Mandela stood for. And I'm a strong believer of Pan-Africanism and identity of Pan-Africa, the unity and integration of Africa. And I think that would be the common solution if we all adapt in our country, in our country, the continent. If we, if we reinforce that and make sure that we are united, not divided, by poses and Westphalian system imposed upon us by the Western leaders, but we can overcome this, not eliminate them, but overcome with them, that we can uh, prosper uh, in the near future. Uh, thank you so much, Gulet. Um, Oba, please welcome to join. Please welcome to join to, to answer this question. Um, for me, I'm like I'm in my last year of, of college, um, so I am working on. Um, I'm a co-founder of this organization, and uh, my aim and our aim in general is to at least you know reduce the number of girls that go through FGM in Somaliland. And um, my ambition is to one day to um, abolish FGM in Somaliland and also empower Somali women and you know teach them and, and advocate for their rights because a lot of them, they don't even know if they do have rights. And I believe by education and by giving them the skills, um, many women will be aware of you know, their rights. And that's what I am doing. And I'm also um, here, here at AEB, because I'm, I'm still in Lebanon. I also teach um, um, refugee, uh, Syrian refugees. And I always um, try to give what I have to others and be nice to everyone and, and always try to, um, you know, 
diversify those people around me because like when when you educate yourself um when you are aware of other cultures and i am also learning the history of african continent in general because i believe in it's my responsibility um to know more about my country and not only my country but also the rest of the world so i can through so i can grab the knowledge i need and give back to my community in general thank you so much Obah. and I will hand over to our last speaker, John. Please welcome to join and 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 answer this question. Okay, so um, basically, I work with a team um, in Eduval, and what we're trying to do is to see how that we can reignite the passion of studying African history uh, through games. Uh, so what we do is that we build games, um, both board games, particularly for underserved communities where you know they do not have access to technology and we also build um, 3d games using technology so what we do is we help people learn the history of whatever place it is in africa that they want to learn using the board games and in the process teach them things like leadership intelligence emotional intelligence social intelligence and we built that already for um, nigeria we are currently working on a board game for the united nations sdg goals uh, but after which we want to start working with other African states to see how that we can collaborate and build games from their history or whatever thing that they want us to do. Um, games on. So yes, uh, we are open for uh, collaborations and uh, partnerships that were necessary. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, John. Uh, and thank you all for, for our esteemed panelists for your time, energy, uh, for turning this, this, this discussion into brilliant points. And, 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 and I really thank you for, for, your, for your patience. And also I wanna to thank to our um, attendees and all those who are connected in our different social media channels for turning in tonight. Thank you all. And for that, I will hand over to it uh, the virtual manager of Hargis Cultural Center. Thank you very much, Shakib, and uh, and thank you to all the panelists who were in uh, who took part to this program tonight. I commend and salute all the work that you're doing, and uh, which is all about actually improving or in the uh, the conditions of life of our citizens in the particular countries and, uh, and uh, also for this tonight in uh, the reflection of the legacy that Nelson Mandela has left to us as Africans, how we can in, uh, implement that in our in, uh, daily in uh, work, daily in uh, life, that is where the, this, this discussion was about. And as Hargeisa Cultural Center, this in uh, program will not be the first and will not be, I mean, will not be the last to bring young Africans and Africans in general together to discuss such in, uh, in uh, important issues and the matters that actually in, uh, in uh, the, the issues that matters to the continent and to the to its people and will 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 try and we do will do our best to bring Africans young Africans together to exchange in good practice and experience and as a in and also link or connect Somaliland the Republic of Somaliland to the continent and I thank you once, well, once, uh, in, uh, in, uh, once more to, to your contributions and to be here tonight with us as a panelist, as attendees, and those who were viewing us live on Facebook. Thank you very much. And I wish you all a very, in, uh, in the, I wish you all the best for all what you're doing and, and good evening to you all. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>